I'm Harry Rogers and welcome to Class of the Past. This is the only place to come for in-depth interviews with former Luton Town players and managers. Over the coming months, I'll be bringing you plenty of discussions with some of the club's most memorable names throughout the years, covering the highs and lows of their time with the Hatters. For those that want to read through the highlights of my interviews, you can go to classofthepast.com where you'll find an extended article. Or for those who like to listen on the go, this podcast will be available on YouTube. Now, I can't think of a better person to help me launch this new series. He is one of the club's longest serving players, accumulating more than 400 appearances. So I'm thrilled to bring you defender and Hatters legend, Marvin Johnson. Marv tells me where his love of the game came from, Derby Day memories against Watford, and what it was like to experience racism on the football pitch. Be sure to like Class of the Past on social media and let me know who you want to see included in the future. But for now, here's what happened when I caught up with a former Luton skipper. Welcome to Class of the Past. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, no worries at all. Um, so I thought it would be interesting, um, firstly, for, for me to get to know a little bit more about um, you and your childhood and kind of where you grew up and, and your first kind of memories of, of football. So first memories for me was growing up in a little place called Ellsbury and I... Uh, I, I, no one else in my family, as, as to our knowledge, um, was involved in the game. And so we had a next door neighbour who was a, a man who ran a Sunday league team and we lived next door and I used to play out on the, on the park, as you call it, with his son and a few other mates and he was running a Sunday league team and they asked me if I wanted to join their, their team. And I, I mean, and I, I mean, didn't really know too much about the game, but I said, yes, of course. I mean, I enjoyed it. I was playing it most days with my mates on the field. And so that was the first really start for me on um, the football trail. Mm. And so, so it was like a local team, was it then? That, um... Yeah, it's yeah, it a local team called Bearbrook Rangers. I mean, okay. they, grew, they grew to get like quite big in Ellsbury and we, we, we eventually went to Wickham because like, the competition was 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 getting a little bit too comfortable for us and so we started going out of um our town and started playing other teams in different leagues and, and that eventually led to us playing a Luton select 11 on on a sunday and a couple of boys myself and another lad got selected to come and practice with the the youth team mm. Okay, so is that kind of how the journey started for you then? Um, sort of uh, Luton coming in and kind of seeing that the sort of player you were. Yeah, I mean, I had, I had trials beforehand. I mean, I always wanted from me from a young age, from when I started playing with Bearbrook, wanted to perceive this as a career sort of thing if I could if I was good enough. And I had trials at Oxford, I think maybe Swindon. And I wrote, as, as, as most young kids did, I suppose, back in the day to different clubs saying, hey, is it possible for you to come and watch me or is it possible for me to come out on trial? And, and I think my mum my and my dad, I still have the, the letters somewhere. Oh, <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I, mean, I remember there's, there's, there's one um, from Manchester United. There's, um, I think, I mean, I was writing to, I mean, unbeknown to me as a, as a probably as a nine and a, and a ten year old, how far these places were, Harry, is a case that, I mean, Manchester from Ellsbury is, is miles away. God knows if they would have said, yes, you can come up and, and practice and try and talk my parents into getting me there. But yeah, I mean, Arsenal, Tottenham, all, all, all the London clubs I've probably reached out to because, I mean, geograph geographically, I've probably worked out that, I mean, that would have been quite handy. But again, I, I mean, I got letters saying, um, unfortunately, at this time, when we, we would not take any players in and then um like i said we had a, a, a game against luton and so eventually i mean i always kept pushing and kept trying to make sure that i, I put myself in the good stead to to perform and i got the opportunity through that to go and join luton after having that practice game with them mm. so, so take me back to that time then i mean I, I read the i think you're 18 years old when you signed your first professional deal with the club uh, I believe it was John Moore that signed you, if I'm correct. No, it was um, David Coates. David, David Coates. Coates. Well, I mean, so I I originally was one of the late ones, as you call it. I mean, mm. I was at school and I was practicing with um, the the club 
for probably about well, on a Wednesday. We used to practice on, on believe it or not, on the on the car park. We're oh, most wow. car park now. Imagine so, yeah. that now, like <laughs> I know. So we used to put um, David Coates was a, was a great, fantastic coach. Was was originally with the first team with David Pleat, and then ended up working with the youth team, and so. I end up uh, playing for the, the youth team and we used to practice on a Wednesday, turn up. Um, my parents used to bring me across on a Wednesday night and we'd practice for an hour or so there and, and eventually play on a Saturday. So I was one of the, the I said, when I said late ones, it's a case where I'm sure in the academies now they have players who are in there from the age of eight. And so mm. they're all, everyone knows each other. So mm. that's what I meant as a late one. By the time I joined what was, was the youth team then they had players who had been there for like four or five years mm. so they had already built a, like a, a, a neat companionship with each other sort of thing so it wasn't a case until i got to my final year at school where most of the kids had already been told because obviously the club knew them that they were going to be taken on as apprentice or maybe not so they can go and look elsewhere but there was still myself and a lad called Sean Farrell, who um, who lived down the road, who um, was not told yet un until literally probably, I think probably about six months. I mean, I got told um, just before or just after like, Christmas time, before I le left school that year, that I was going to get taken on as an apprenticeship. Mm. And, and was that around sort of 1986? Was that right? 84. 84. 84. I left school in 85. Yeah, I left school in 85. End of like, end of, end of the 84, beginning of the 85, Harry. Okay. And I'm just trying to kind of picture it. So you're, you're in the youth setup. And obviously, in 1988, Luton go on to have, you know, one of the greatest days in the club's history. Um, what what kind of your your memories behind the scenes about that? Did you ever kind of um, I don't know see some of the first team to look up to, or were they kind of mentors for you? I'm just trying to think. You know, you're in and around that environment. Obviously, I know you're the first team, but well, I, just, you know, I mean, well, just going back to obviously like so, eighty five was when I left school, and I then I went and joined Luton straight from school mm -hmm. as an as a, an apprentice, as they call it in those days, and and then like you said, the big day in eighty eight. Unfortunately for me, I mean, I was in, I mean, I was involved in some of the games in the lead up to that. So I mean, I played in um, I think it was Leeds. We played away. Um, we we had a one nil one nil victory, and then I played a home game. I'm not sure if it was against Man City, but I mean, because we got to the final on the eighty nine as well. I mean, mm. some of those games, what I'm talking about now, it might have been different <laughs> years, but obviously because we lost the following year. But mm. I was so I was heavily involved in two or three games each year in the lead up because I mean we, we, we were quite successful in 88 getting to was it three cup finals was it like mm. the year we got to the Simmer Cup FA Cup semi-final mm. and then yeah. uh, the lit was so we, again you're going to need a, a relatively big squad and so mm. I was very fortunate fortunate to be involved in the, some of the games and so um, when it came to the big day it was a case where they only had two subs. I was involved. I mean, I was staying at the, we used to stay at the Crest. Is it the Crest? Just sort of the Junction 11, the hotel. I can't remember what the hotel was called, but we stayed there mainly and had pre-match meals there just off Junction 11. There's a hotel there um, and for games. And then we were there the night before because I was in the squad for the, the 88 final against Arsenal. Mm. And um, Ray Hartford named the team. I mean, and, and, the, and, the, and the subs. I mean, I, there was probably, a, I don't know, a slight out chance. Maybe I was hoping that I might get on the bench. But I mean, there was like the likes of like different, like Mark Steen and I think Ashley Grimes were the two subs in that day. And so, you I mean, there's, there's players of of a much junior like um, position than I was as a, as, a, as a youngster who were going to be involved in the game. And but again, Kingsley Black made um, played in the game, which was a surprise to everyone because um, like he had, I think, played a couple of games in the, in the round similar to himself and played a, a little bit more in the league games. But he had played a couple of games prior up, leading up to the final. And then the week before, he had he didn't play. Um, I think Ray left him out. And he, I mean, if you get Kingsley on, it'd be, I mean, he'd be another great one to talk to because he, he thought that, I mean, 
he, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't going to be playing and literally it, I mean, Ray left him out just resting him knowing that he was already going to play him in the final which was great because Kingsley went on to have a great man of the match performance mm. so it was fantastic to be involved on that day and travel up on the bus with the lads and get to Wembley as I mean I mean I've only left school like two or three years wow. earlier so I, now you know the next thing I'm, I'm, I'm I'm walking out at Wembley in the dress rooms and seeing stuff and being involved in, in, in that a day and especially the how the day ended and how the final went. I mean, back and forth and I mean and then right at the end, Steenie getting the winner. It was I mean, it was fantastic because I mean, we have we had a celebration um, at the um I can't remember what the hotel's called now in, in London, but it was I mean, it was already on like whether we won or lost but it just made it a little bit more special that we won and my family my mom my dad my sister were all there and they had the meal and stuff and we stayed in the hotel so it was it was a great day mm. i mean it's just slightly before my time unfortunately but you know i've i've seen videos and um you know my dad that's why i'm a luton fan because my dad passed down the family um, what what were the celebrations like in Luton? I mean, I've seen like the videos of, of fans lying in the streets for for miles. It seems. I mean, it must have been an amazing. amazing. No, it, again, it was like it was it was crazy. It was mad because being being involved at such a young age, even though I didn't play on the day or was involved, I mean, I felt I played a part in some of the games in the previous rounds leading up to it. So. It was great to be involved in the, in the town hall celebrations mm. and like you said the, the the whole of luton was absolutely packed it was like i mean crazy i mean i was like mind-boggling to see how and why so many like i mean i, I couldn't even imagine what it's like like being um like a a, a manchester united player and having these because obviously you yeah. win a lot and it, it must be like i mean again send like chills up your spine because like, i mean it was it was great i mean because obviously i mean it was you was representing like the, the club and the loot and the town itself and to see all these people out and like cheering and jumping on the bus and the bus couldn't i mean the bus we had to walk a lot of the way <laughs> because the, the bus couldn't get literally because i mean it was announced mm -hmm. that we were going to be coming to the town hall and have a reception and so they literally flogged the streets and the, the bus couldn't get out there. so we had to walk probably a, 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 about half a mile to get to the to the final part of the town hall <laughs> like rock stars <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, said, I, can, I can only imagine what it's like if you're, you're in a, a club who's winning trophies year on especially like a man city now is it, it, it's it's a, yeah. it's a great feeling and i can see why obviously you I mean the, the likes of those top clubs want to keep the momentum of well next year let's go again let's go again because it is it's a it's, a, it's an adrenaline buzz and something which mm. you would, would love to to experience um, as much as possible and i mean you weren't involved that day but you were involved in the build-up um but it was at wimbledon i believe away in 1988 that you made your league debut so it's your first yeah. chance playing in the league um what can you kind of remember about that because you've been involved in the, the build-up and it's your first time the manager said look you're going to play your first league game um i think the team you were playing against correct me if i'm wrong again um the age showing but um I believe there were some sort of infamous players on the other side of the pitch playing in blue as well. Yes, I mean, again, like I said, a lot, of, a lot of um, games were played that year, and Mal had been carrying a knock. Mal was like a Mal Donoghue, an absolutely mm. true warrior, like for Luton, a Luton legend, and Northern Ireland international played in the World Cup for Northern Ireland, and so he was like struggling for weeks for like with a, a little in well not a little but i mean an injury which he was carrying and so it was a case where at some point i think ray arthur the manager had said to me look you know there's probably gonna you know you're gonna get an opportunity but it, i mean i don't know when but like i mean i was and I, I knew it was getting close because i think the two games before i made my debut i was sub um and then there two subs in those days and so it, it, gave, it gave me an insight to thinking, well, I'm, I know Mal struggling because, it, I mean, I'm sub. I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. I, even though I've not made my debut, I'm, I'm sub. So that, that, that it was in mind that, I mean, he's having injections and stuff. And so I remember being sub at Highbury against Arsenal. And that was like, my God, I, I, Harry, I, I think if I if Mal went down that day, I, that probably 
could have been the beginning and end of my career in one, yeah. in one day because I've never been so nervous mm. in my entire life. And I don't think I would have been able to have played, if I'm totally honest, because just the sheer atmosphere of the game. I mean, 30, 30 plus thousand at Arsenal, Highbury and like, I mean... I, I, I'm not, I mean, it was it was it was mind boggling and a very I mean a great considering experience at the same time. But I was really bricking it, as to, mm. to put it mildly. If like Ray said, "Oh look, that was gone down. Go go get warmed up. Go and get warmed up." And he was like, oh, "Hard oh, thing, yeah." yeah. <laughs> like when come on, I'm like, in in a way, I was like, "Yeah, it'd be great to make my like debut um, at Arsenal and, and at Highbury." And at the same time, I was thinking, "What if I don't?" Like do well, don't perform, don't do well, and so I mean, fortunately for for us and for and for Luton, like Mal got through the game. But then I remember playing midweek a game. I mean, it might have been a Simod Cup game. Mm -hmm. I think that was my first actual debut for the first team in the Simod Cup at, at Goodison Park, Everton, wow. which I think was um, great for me because again, not the the. The atmosphere and not nowhere near as many as the crowd because obviously it was a it like a minor cup, a similar cup. Even though again we went on to to get to the final that year, and unfortunately leaves to Reading. But it was a case where I was playing in a first team game for the first time in my career, and I had a great man, Steve Foster, beside me mm. who guided me through the game. And and I, for me, I mean, I'm I'm quite confident, and and I had it. I mean. I, Looking back on the game, as it get, we won one zero. I remember one two zero. I think um, Dave Oldfield scored, and um, I can't think who scored the other goal. But we kept a clean sheet and ended up winning. And so like, that gave me confidence, even though it was a little, not a, a big major um, game. It was. It gave me the confidence that I could play and I could be on the same level of these players. And so when the Wimbledon game came up, I think it was that weekend. Mal wasn't. Mal wasn't declared fit. I knew on the Thursday or Friday that I was going to be playing. I wasn't, I was nervous, but nowhere near as nervous mm. as I, I probably would have been. Again, like you mentioned earlier on, the infamous um, Dons, um, the crazy gang as they were known back then. Yeah. You have, um, Vinnie Jones, and you have J John Fashionu, you know, Laurie Sanchez, Dennis Wise, all these players, and probably like, I mean, you're too young to remember, but a lot of people who probably were listening or, or watching this will know the players who I'm talking about. And I mean, they were a notorious like group mm -hmm. of players who, like, in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, who had their own way of playing, a certain way of playing, and welcoming you to, the, to their home ground, shall we say, to speak. And mm -hmm. as a big, Ghetto blasters, they called it back in the day, blaring loud music and bash the bash as they called him back in the day. I mean, a, a big, strong centre forward, and so it was a bit of a, a baptism of fire. They called it for me to make my debut, but I'm 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 one of them ones who would always stand up to the challenge. And so, unfortunately for me, um, that I mean, again, I always play the game how I see it, and I felt confident that the ball got played to me, and I was in probably midway in our half, and it was a case where I probably gone round one player but like again being my first game it, my natural progression would have been like to if I'm playing literally normally would be like to just to, to be instinctive and so my next mm. time was to go around the next player because the, the, the player the, the, the pace of the game is so much more quicker Harry and like so the another player had already closed me down whereas normally if in a a, a reserve team game or youth team game because I was still 18 it'd be a case where I've gone past one now and now I've got time to see the field but we're playing we're talking about the, the first division now the English Premier League like literally mm. so it's the pace is much quicker and the ball got robbed and they went through and scored and so within the first 15 minutes of me making my full debut I've given a goal away and we're losing 1-0 but I mean Steve Foster Rob Johnson who were part of the back four. Um, I'm not sure if it was Tim Breaker. Les Seeley, God bless him, is, 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 who was in goal. Not one of them. I mean, whether or not it was a case, cause just trust me, I've got rollickings from those players for like maybe not doing, as I told, or doing and making, taking too many risks at times. But not one of those players turned around and said a single word to me. I think they probably knew that. I mean, I knew that I'd make a mistake and just them saying anything or trying to jump on top of me would probably... Mm push me down even more and maybe they, they probably knew because they were smart enough that 
I had the rest of the game to get through. I mean, I still had another like um, 65, 75 minutes to go through before the end of the game. So they didn't, they were great. They were fantastic. And I, mm -hmm. and I actually went on and got through the game and we ended up losing 2-0 and they scored late in the second half. But I ended up overall, apart from the goal, having a comfortable game and even um, fast, Fashion who at the end came up and said to me, "Look, I mean, he called me, and again throughout the game, he's talking from goal kicks to this game. But he was going put it, put it on young. It's called me young blood. Like put it on young blood's heads because like I was like a new player. They knew I was making my debut and stuff. But I didn't. I mean, I didn't react. I just like I battled and carried on and played the game and got through the game. And he said to me at the end of the game, you know, I mean, well done, well competed, well battled and stuff. So." I mean, apart from the goal, I mean, yes, I was I was quite happy with the performance, but I mean, we live and learn. Yeah, I mean, what's that like as well? Um, I mean, there might have been other examples in your career you can think of, but um, when you know that the goal was your fault, I mean, how do you deal with that? Because I know if it was me, I, I'd be mortified. And like you said, you might get a few shouts, but on that day, um, you know, Foster and that was really good with you. But what, what's yeah. that like when you've got the crowd on you and you know that, that that's your fault? I mean, like, again, I think for, for, for me, I'm all, I mean, I've, like I said, I mean, I've always been quite confident in my own ability. And and I even take this now into to my my coaching career now with with the co with the girls and the boys I coach here at Revolution. It's a case where like everyone makes mistakes. I said mm. to the, the girls and boys, like I mean, even I will make mistakes as a, as your coach, all right? So it's it's human, and I I would never like like criticize you or jump on you guys for making a mistake. So mm. for me, I've always tried to practice what I preach and. and I didn't. I didn't feel any added pressure. I just felt. Listen, I, a lot of the things in my life, in general, I mean, what happens happens. You know, what I mean, there's, there's no point worrying about it. You can't go back and you can't, like, like rectify it. So I don't focus on it. And so for me, as 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 Marvin, as an individual, I mean, I'm always quite strong to move on and say, okay, I've made mm -hmm. that mistake, but now let's move on, let's focus, and let's move forward because you, you can, therefore, if you're focusing on it make more mistakes and continue in it and it spirals a little bit where it could have been a case where you know that could have been the end of my career because i could have mm. made another mis two mistakes and it's like oh my gosh he's given away three goals today there's no way we can play this kid again so i was quite strong i'd like to think i was quite strong and like i said i didn't focus on the mistake mm. i mean we will get some more, you know, positive stuff eventually. I just thought, fine. listen, I'm Harry. I'm, listen again. It's all part. I mean, it's all part and part of your career. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, upset or frustrated about talking about anything. I mean, and then listen, everyone, everyone has negatives, and there's always mm. going to be positives. And so, like, I mean, right? Life is not all a, um, a, like I call it. They say a bed of roses sort of thing, and everything's always, always good. I mean, there's mm. always ups and downs. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean. Again, you'll have to give me probably my A show, but I had a little look through uh, some of the seasons you played in. I mean, there were there were I think four four re different relegations. Uh, you know, the club has always kind of been up and down until most recently, where you know it's it's looking in a really positive light. Um, the one that stood out for me was I think it was ninety five ninety six. I mean, you'd kind of built your way into the first team at this point. Uh, I believe you were club captain. Um, how tough is that kind of on morale when you know things necessarily aren't going right on the pitch, but you know you're the leader in the dressing room that people have got to come to you to you know for for leadership. I mean, right. how how difficult is that to kind of get get everyone to go again when it's you know it, it's, it's a difficult time. It's tough, but like you said, I mean, I was one of the most senior players that year and cap captain of the, of the of the of the club, and it's a case where you have to lead by example. And I feel that we had, a, I mean, we had a, a quite a few a youngish squad that season as well. So you, you you put things in perspective, and you know it's going to be a tough arts and a tough battle. But you you hope you try to lead by example, and and you give the guidance to the younger ones to to see that no matter what, you always keep giving everything and make sure that you play every minute from the first minute to the last minute until it's mathematically not possible that you're going to be able to stay up, sort of thing. Mm. I mean, yeah, I can only imagine it must be difficult. But um, one thing that did stand out as well when I was having a little look back was, well, as a Luton fan, for me especially, you know, the, the Watford derby is is always the one that we all look forward to. 
Um, and there was a goal that stood out. And it was a 1-1 draw. And I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you will, um, you, you got the equaliser. Um, yeah. What's it like in the build-up to a game like that? Is it is it different? Does it feel different? Or is it you're very professional and, you know, you're uh, like, you know, game heads on? I, I'd, be totally, I'd, I'd be totally honest, Harry. I think anyone, for me, anyone, if they say it's just another game or just another game, I mean, they're lying. I mean, it, I, mean I think, mm. I don't know if it's different for me because I, I spent all my career at Luton and I came for the ranks and I played against Watford in the youth team, reserves and stuff. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not the same level of intensity as it is at the first team level, but I can assure you those first team games were like i mean we could we could i as a, as a player and fellow players we could sense what it meant to the town mm. to the club to the supporters that that game was was the biggest game for them in the season and i'm, mm. I'm sure it's going to be the same when um they play on april the first i think it is and, yeah and it's going to be like uh, again it's great that the game's back but it for me i, I mean i relished it i mean i loved it i mean we we and I was very fortunate. I think I don't think I ended up. I think I played twelve to thirteen, maybe on the losing side once, probably out of all those games. So I'm very fortunate to to have, like one to to participate in as many as those, and two, like you just said, to get that equaliser at Vicarage Road um, when we was like getting close to the end. I think they went one nil, one one goal up in the first half, and the second half we were pushing and pushing and pushing and. I can remember, I think it was um, Dave Oldford or Paul McLaren had a shot and it was a case where I saw like, def like on purpose deflecting the ball in a different direction because it wasn't a, it wasn't like a, a hard shot which was going to go and beat the goalkeeper in my opinion. So I saw like just took my foot out to deflect the ball towards the goal at a different angle and then it went in. And I mean, again, to, to score like in the derby was great. I mean, we didn't get I mean, uh, uh, for me, it was a case where, like, I probably knowing me in my head, it was like, I, I don't think I'd ever lost a derby. And so I'm thinking, oh, shit, I don't want to lose. I mean, I can't. And to lose to, to like, to them, of all people, like, in, uh, on their on their home ground, I'd be, like, gutted sort of thing. But then to score the equaliser, knowing that we'd not lost. And I think, actually, I got injured because, I mean, my hamstring was really, I mean, in those games, you, 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 you're pushing yourself probably a little bit more than you probably naturally would because you know what this game means mm. to everyone and the support and stuff. And so I, I think I tore my hamstring literally in the last couple of minutes of the game when mm. we were under like a lot of pressure. So I think I was out for like three, like yeah, two months, three months. Mm, blimey. Battled on, got got the draw at least. You didn't get a yeah, yeah, exactly. That was that was that, funny enough. That I mean, again, I mean, I'm I'm, 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 I'm writing a book. I'm currently writing a book, and, and, okay. and uh, yeah. So I think I mean I've 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 not had it edited yet, but like I'm just in the process, and I remember putting that in the book. I mean, whether I was thinking well, would I would I have taken the not scoring and being like injury free for like a three months I was out for uh, quite a while because a ruptured hamstring you're out for quite a long yeah. time or scoring and taking the ruptured hamstring and I mean I think I, I mean I, I think in the end I decided that I mean I'd rather the score and, and have the injury and and because it's not it wasn't like a life-threatening injury I suppose yeah that's how much it means to, 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 to us players sometimes mm. I mean obviously as a as a defender you, you didn't score many but I don't think I can talk to you without also bringing up I think you know which game we're talking about, the, the Ipswich game. Um, I'm sure you've told this story plenty of times, but just, yeah, give me a bit of an insight about that day. And, you know, I, I've watched it back, uh, some of the highlights, and it seems, it, you know, one minute in front, behind, you know, yeah. it was a crazy, crazy game. And you, I've seen the footage of you running away and, like, when you got the winner. What what was it like to play in? And, um, yeah. It, um, it, it, was, it was strange because Ipswich were the were the favourites. They were the team who were in the higher division then. I think they were in the championship and we might have been League One. And we had gone to, because back then, the League Cup, I mean, I mean, what was it called then? Back then, I'm not sure what it was called back then because it's been called the Rombolo's Cup, it's been called the Kai, I mean, it's been called so yeah, many sorts. Yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, it's easy to, to refer it to as the League Cup because it was the League Cup, League teams playing it. And so we went to Ipswich and we played at Ipswich, and I think we were. I mean, we had lost the first first leg because it was two legs back then. And um, when we 
we had come back to Luton, we had uh, literally, I think, gone two goals up. I mean, so we've gone like, equal. no, sorry, they scored actually. They scored. Mm. I think they scored. And then, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if it was 1 0 to them in the first leg, and then they've gone one up at Kenilworth Road to go two up. And then we've come back into it with um, goals from Stuart Douglas and Andrew Fortiardis and 2 2. And then, like you said, it's it's got to the stage where I think we've then scored. Steve Davis, central defender's partner, scored, and we're now going through. And then they've scored, or oh, you know, he scored an own goal actually. Mm. Steve Davis, and it's now they're going through on the way goals, and it, it had everything in the game. So yeah. um, we go to extra time, and so we're going to the 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 hundred and twentieth minute of like the the game, and literally we got a corner, and I. I remember that they had Richard Wright, I think it was. I mean, he was an ex-Arsenal goalkeeper, played for England on a couple of occasions. He was in goal and Matthew Spring took the corner and he literally, I mean, I've, I've explained this and I've, I've talked about this before many a time. And to, to me, when it, when, it, when it was happening, Harry, it was literally like slow motion. <laughs> literally, honestly, it was, it was just, I, I, it's, 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 it's crazy. Like I said, as the ball's coming in, I've seen him now, Richard Wright, the goalkeeper, going up. And I think he's gone to try and, like, catch it, but, like, catch it with one hand and then bring the other hand. But as he's gone with his left hand, it's sort of like, I'm sort of, like, standing there and it's sort of, like, hit his, like, fingertips so he to grab it. And then now it's just looped up in the head, in the air. And now I've just gone, like, just for, just, just, just stay calm and just get it on target. And so I've just, mm. just headed it back into the to the corner into the other corner and it's just gone in but it obviously was a slow motion but they, to me that's how it happened because I can explain mm -hmm. it and it's like clearly like that but then like you said it because we knew it was, a, it was a last final probably kick of the game and last chance and the lads are trying to grab me and I'm running and like I said two hours after two hours of like I mean 120 minutes two hours of yeah four, we, we, I mean, we still got the energy to run around and celebrate like that. It, it, yeah, it was great. And because, again, it was special because the, the, the Kenilworth Road on cup games on during the week were the best games for me. I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously, we love playing the game and it's great to, to look forward to a game on a Saturday. But it just has something special about it, the Kenny, when it was a, a cup game. On the mm. midweek game, night game, the atmosphere and the crowd got behind you. It was it was fantastic. Yeah, a lot of people. I mean, obviously, I'm biased, but it's not just fans that say about Kenilworth Road being special. But you hear a lot of people come to the ground, especially now. It's almost like a, a relic. People taking pictures of the Oak Road and all of that. Um, you know, going through people's houses to the ground. I mean, I, I love it, and I know others do. Um, What's it like just in general, like uh, to, to play on that pitch? I mean, the fans so close to you. Um, it works both ways. Obviously, if things aren't going your way, I'm sure you'll know yeah, about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah what, what's it kind of like to, to, to play there? I think I think it, I think it's great. I mean, it's it can be a tough place to, to be, especially if the if the, as a team you're not doing well, because again, the Luton fans would let you know. I mean, that they, 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 in low on certain times, they, I mean, they would like show their like like not approval or their disappointment in a performance or in a, a performance as a player or as a, as, a, as a team. But at the same time, I've played many a game where we've not ended up on the winning side and the fans, I mean, which I can always say have always been fair and, and true because like I mean, we've, we've lost games, but we've got applauded off the field because they, I mean, they know what, good football is i mean they love to see good football i mean it's, it's strange in a way where i mean we've we, we played some games where you know you, you've got you've got beat but we've played really well and at the same time we're like oh the crowd are like are clapping and applauding because i think i mean again being there a long time luton love to see good football luton fans love to see good football the balls on the ground being played quick interchange passing fast flowing and it's always been the way i mean we've never been a long ball team and I think that's been a little bit of a, a a buy for some of the performances when we've played really really well and maybe not got the right result the support have known I think if you if you give a hundred percent and you work hard and you you're you, you mean you're committed to the cause and you're you know you're flying into tackles and uh, they'll get behind you 100 percent no matter what the result is mm. 
no hiding, no hiding somewhere like that. Yeah, they listen, there's no hiding, no hundred percent. I mean, like you said, the fans are very close and, and on top of you, and at the same time, I mean, you could hear everything. I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's quite amusing sometimes, you know, especially when you, like you're doing well and the opposing team are like, I've got a couple of characters who things are not going that way. That, that some of the supporters are just like chirping away and giving them stick and. <laughs> And the, 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 you can be on the field of a player, and he's like, he's turning around and thinking, "Is it? Is they, have they just said that? Have they just said that to me?" <laughs> and it's it, it's it's great. It's great. Yeah. Uh, does anywhere kind of compare to it? I mean, uh, you played in all sorts of stadiums. I mean, um, is, there, is there a place where you played that um, that you particularly like playing away at because it was a either it was a nice ground or it was a good atmosphere or somewhere like that? For me, the the place. Where, I mean, again, I would always like say i was very fortunate is that anfield was a was a great place and i mean i was a, a liverpool supporter growing up because one when i um was started watching the game my first cup final i can remember watching was as a kid was the 1977 cup final and it mm -hmm. was liverpool versus manchester united and manchester united won two one and so i mean i took to be, to be a Liverpool supporter because Liverpool lost. I just like being on the underdogs. I like the underdogs. And so that was the team I supported as a kid growing up because that was the first real cup final I can remember watching and getting up and going for the day on the, on the, on the and seeing the, the teams mm. come around the bus and stuff. And so once I got to Luton and, and we were in the like first division now, it was the old, like it was now the English Premier League. Liverpool was a, was a, was definitely a place where I was looking forward to and hopefully getting the, the opportunity to go and play and I got that opportunity again in 88 because like I said we had so many games and we didn't have a big squad that's probably what they would have now and um, we went to Anfield and we I think yeah, we tied 1-1 we played in midweek because that's the same week I think they had the cup final because they, they played Wimbledon and we lost Wimbledon in the semi-final and mm. um, they were playing Wimbledon that that week, and so they rested a lot of players, and so I got to play against my hero, grown up. I mean, uh, Kenny Douglas, so Kenny Douglas, sorry, and he came on as player manager, and he he, he came on as like I mean, wow. Anfield, at Anfield, Liverpool, literally three four years ago at school i had pictures of this guy on my bedroom wall because um <laughs> it's kenny ducks the sort yeah. of thing and now here i am marking him so it, it was it was great i mean a, a fantastic experience because like i said to get the player anfield and but i mean to, to tie as well one one and get a result and not end up in a on a on a trousing as, as they do to some teams back then it was great mm. and just touching on uh, when you said about uh, how you could hear fans uh, sometimes in the crowd pointing out things, um, I just thought it might be interesting to find out a little bit more about um, if you kind of experienced any, um, you know, racism in the game. I mean, you played in an era of football that was very different. I mean, it's still there's still problems today and we, we've got yeah. charities and awareness and things like that. Um, but I just think that for me, it's important that to truly move forward, you kind of have to share things that might have happened in the past, uh, past to to you know make make hopefully a, a better future. So I just didn't know if you had any experiences yourself in that area um, that that you'd be willing to talk about. Of course, I mean, I mean, starting out in my in my career growing up, there was I mean, not too many like players who were, were black, and and I mean, we had. Ricky Hill, we had Brian Steen, Mark Steen, Brian's brother, mm. and who else? We had Mecca Nairobi, we had, but it, it was it was still like early, like I said, like for the game and, and the racism was still there. And, we, and then a couple of like places where we went, it was like, I mean, I wouldn't say it was intimidating because my parents were fantastic growing up as a, as a, as a, a young um, person, they they made sure that obviously I was aware of there's going to be some people who are not going to be too like favourable of me as a person just because of the colour of my skin. Mm. So I I was put in in in, a, in the right place where if we went to maybe like an odd like couple of London clubs were who were not too like had too many black players in their team, it would be quite. I mean. 
not intimidating, but like you could hear it, like literally. And I, I mean, I can remember one time being at um, a certain London club, and it was a case where I could literally see the hatred in like the the supporters' eyes shouting. And I mean, it did, and and then I mean, again, I mentioned this in the book. It's a case where like I looked looked at him, and it was a case where he had him, and then he had his son, and then he had his probably his. Um, son, son. So it's like a granddad, dad, dad of generation. So you could see how, like, it's it's it was going to be difficult to change. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't a case where, like, I'm thinking or oh, any anger, Harry, towards him. I, in a way, I felt sorry for him. I literally, yeah. I, looked, oh, I mean, how sad that you're being this way towards me just because of the color of my skin. So it, again, I thank my parents for me. They never affected me. I mean, if anything, it made it just spurred me on even more. And, and like I said, I mean, I looked at them in more in pity, if that, if that mm. makes sense, you know? Mm. And I experienced it all the way um, going towards the end of my career when we played a, a certain Welsh club um, and they were similar. I mean, I, I, was, I was like playing and literally they were just like making the noises and stuff like that. It, it, again, it, it affected more than my teammates, you know what I mean? More than mm. it did me, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, like are, you, are you okay, Mark? Yeah, yeah, fine. Why? What's the matter? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so you, in, a, in a way, like I said, I mean, I felt sorry for these supporters that they were, were, they were deemed to feel that certain way. And it, it and they, again, I'm, I mean, I'm different. Some people, it might be a case where, like, it does affect them and they get angry, they get upset. And and, and, and I've heard the talk about sometimes they say, oh, you know, would you walk off the field? Should we walk off the field? I mean, I, if, me personally, Harry, if that was, if that, no, I would never walk off the field. I said, well, I said what, just because they're, this is how I look at it, just because they're making noises. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. That, that, I mean, that's, that's all. I mean, listen, if they want to make noises, it's not affecting me. Trust me. It, I would never walk off a field. I wouldn't couldn't say, look, come, no, because they're winning that way. I mean, you're focusing on them. You're giving them, like, ammunition to say, mm. oh, look, what we're doing is working. Next, next time, do it to this game, and then maybe they might walk off. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it, I would never walk off the field. I mean, I was, again, like I said, I thank my parents for bringing me up the way and, and educating me the way they did because it, it, it literally didn't affect me at all. It's a good way to be, I guess, as well, because you said about it, you, you know, you didn't let it affect you. But I, I can imagine if you were a young player and you're, you're you know, you're being you're being targeted just, just for, the, you know, the colour of your skin, <laughs> it can be a really tough thing to do. So that's amazing to think that, you know, you, it was your teammates that were kind of backing you up and, you know, saying, you're all right and you're like yeah, yeah i just want to go on with the game so yeah it's, it's an amazing place to be um i was just going to say as well um you did have one promotion and it's an era that i actually this is the first kind of time i remember so slowly getting into my era now um under joking here and towards the end of your career now um tell me a little bit about that team i mean there's some real characters in there um do, what was the the element of success? I know there were some good players, but it seemed like the team was really together as well at that time. I mean, they were, and I mean, I've spoken to it many a time on different players on, on my podcast and having different people on. I mean, we had the likes of Kevin Nichols, who was who was the captain. Um, then um, we had Steve Howard, we had um, Matthew Spring, you had... Um, Steve Robinson. So you had a great blend of like senior players and young players who who had come together and, and had this team spirit. And I mean, we had a player called John Louis Valois. I mean, I think most people would would, would, would remember. And, and, I, and I played um, a, a minor role. And then I mean, it would be a case where that it would be Matthew Taylor who went on to have a great career, like with West Ham, Portsmouth, Burnley, different clubs. <coughs> And many games in the Premier League and scoring wonderful, great goals and volleys, and he had a great shot on him. It was a case where Joe would have Matthew playing left back and John Louis Valois playing left wing, and then I would come on to probably more in the latter games when maybe John Louis wasn't maybe like doing it or maybe got a little bit tired, and so that gave him the opportunity to move Matthew up with his good left foot crosses and shots, and I'll just slide into the left back situation and see the game out and 
maybe add a little bit more experience defensively to the team. So it was, I mean, Joe was a wonderful, wonderful manager and a smart manager. And like I said, I mean, tactics, tactics, tactically knew and understood how to see games out and how to structure the games along with Mick. And so, like mm -hmm. I said, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a great um, team to be in and, and be part of. Just a word on Mick as well, why, why we're just bringing him up. I mean, he's still there today. He's, he's, yeah. you know, he's an absolute legend. I mean, what, what's he like to play under and, and just his presence around the place? I mean, we get, so we go back, like, when I first joined the club. So when I, as, as, a, as an apprentice, Mick was, Mick had already at, was at the club. And so mm. we go back all that time, years when being a teammate of his and playing with him. And I, and I, and I can tell you now, I mean, 100% rather have Mick on your team than, than against you because like I said he had a presence where just the sheer to stare at you to look at you right if you didn't do something like and you too is likely I mean his looks could kill like I mean, <laughs> Mick, Mick was Mick, Mick didn't even have to open his mouth so can you can imagine what he'd be like if, if you ended up in a little bit of a, a brawl with him so to have him on your team but like to, to have someone like him who was technically excellent because like i mean you 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 everyone back then just saw mick or knew mick as big mick hartford a big man like normally in the air but mick was like technically like as good if not better than most players like as a center forward he could you know, great body great like player bringing in people into play bringing on his chairs and like bringing the fullbacks into play so to have someone like mick and play with someone like Mick and then eventually play under him while he was with working with Joe was I mean great and like you said and still there to today doing a fantastic job and I still speak to him now like I said and, and I mean he's a, he's a great guy yeah he's a big character and and I think over the years you you've definitely played with with certain characters um is there any that stand out for being I don't know, like the Joker amongst the pack, or have you got any funny stories as well of, of certain players that that you always knew there was going to be a little joke? I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I think if you spoke to, I mean, any other players, I mean, they'd probably say that I was probably the one <laughs> doing mostly you, really the, doing the jokes, yeah, yeah, uh, doing the pranks. I mean, uh, when when Nico Kevin Nichols joined the club, I think. I mean, he was, I mean, a fantastic signing by Joe Mick. He was uh, someone who wore his heart on his sleeve, was a great, like, technical player, but, like, also could mix it and, like, get stuck in. And I think he had the best of, of the both. And so we sort of, like, gravitated towards each other. And then he loved it. He loved the joke. He loved the prank. prank. And, and, I mean, we, we, I mean, we got up to numerous things. I mean, he was more, like... <laughs> ruthless let me say i'll say he was more ruthless than i and then he would do things which i'm thinking oh my gosh i'm not i can't play no part in that and it's like i mean things for example he would bring like fireworks in and literally <laughs> he would like and i think he, he put brian steen was like first team coach he put his um underpants went in and got his underpants and put them on the firework onto a rocket on and and let it off off killer road and literally <laughs> just steal these these his underpants just in bits like of like coming down in the air and, and mm. Steve coming out and going what are you doing letting off fireworks and i'm thinking you don't that's not the harm of it that's your underpants coming down steenie and it's like <laughs> crazy 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 and it goes mm. so i mean yeah great times mm. <laughs> Um, we're getting towards sort of the end of my questions now. Um, how did you know when it was time to call it a day? I mean, did you did you ever envisage that you would go on to be at Luton for the rest of your life? No, the rest of your life, the rest of your career. Yeah, no, no, I, mean, <laughs> I, I suppose in a way, literally. No, again, I I started playing in eighty five and made my debut in eighty eight, and so I was always happy, Harry, at Luton. Mm. Loved. Loved, loved um, the club. Loved how I made the progression to become a first team regular, then become captain of the of the team, captain of the club, and a bit of a leader that way. And so, I mean, I never had any like notion or interest from outside clubs, if there was, or anyone who got or got spoken to by an agent of of looking to leave. And so, it was a case probably when. Just before 
when I played that 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 promotional year that season, when Joe called me into his office and he said, "Hey, it's called me um, Jono." He said, "Jono, look, I mean, you're not getting any younger now." He said, "Look, but I want to get you involved in the coaching side of things." He said, "Why don't you sort of like help out John Moore with the youth team, with a view of like maybe taking over from John, because John's going to retire." He says in a, in a year or so, and so you can still be registered as a player he said and so if in emergencies we need to use you in games and stuff we can do that as well so it made it made natural progression and it wasn't sort of a thing where like oh like i'm still want to play i mean i had a few injuries and it's it, it was harder to get back fitter and like those days were just a little bit beyond me recovering as quick as i used to because i was a quick healer when i when i got injured and so it just made sense for me to turn that progression to go down the coaching line and start and, and do my coaching badges and work with John Moore as his assistant on the youth team and then progress to eventually becoming the youth team academy um, head coach. Mm. And, and do you miss it at all? Do I miss the, 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 um, the do you miss playing? Do you miss that, that feeling on a match day? I know some players when they retire, they, they really miss that buzz, but others no. say that, you know. No, not really. I mean, I mean, I'm here now in 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 America, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm director of coaching at a, a club called Virginia Revolution, who got this fantastic facility. I mean, I'm I'm in. I've got my own office here now, and it's and this is only. I mean, they call it travel soccer, Harry, and it's like. I mean, if to put it on comparison to in England, it's wreck. It's literally mm. like wreck. But I've got an office, and I've got this. We've got this facility where we've got four turf fields and we've got like um, a rooftop bar we've got a restaurant we've got um sand bit volleyball where we play head tennis there we've got like and it's it's just different world i mean yeah. over here so we now have like teams from the age of five to 18 and now we've just got a semi-pro team who we're just starting to to have here now we have an adult league and and, and listen to me and answer to your question is that in the adult league now so we were struggling for teams and so we put a staff team in so i get to play in that which, oh, is, right. <laughs> which is which is which is like again it wasn't too smart because i mean they have it they call it open so that means open means any age group so i'm now as a 54 year old running up against it could be an 18 year old who's like <laughs> like a something like of the, like a, of the twilight film so now <laughs> by the way sort of thing so I, I I love playing for fun and, and and helping out when we have these adult league like programs at our club and, and joining in there. But like it's not something which I'd say. Look, I definitely definitely miss. Um, Marvin, it's been excellent to get to know you. Um, I'm I've thought up a closing question that I'd like to ask to future guests, and and you'll be the first one to answer this. So, you know, if it's rubbish, you can be like, never use that again. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if I was to put your picture in a big scrapbook of Luton players, what do you hope it would say about your time at the club and what do you think uh, you brought the team? Um, it's, it's a good question. So it's not a rubbish question. It's a good question. <laughs> okay, I'll use it again then. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I, w- I, would, I would like it to, um, I like it to say that he always played with a smile and was was had and had fun i mean i mean always smiling um the the, the joker on the, the, the joker the fun guy who who loved who just loved playing i mean that that, that I mean yeah that's that, i mean that's it enjoy, enjoyed and enjoyed my time i mean again i mean i look back now harry and i think to myself it's a case where it's only when your career ends that you and you look back and you, i mean I, I mean, I think I was very fortunate to be to be you know, to be play a professional, to play in the um, and play the game at a professional level. And it's only now when I look back in the history of Luton that I mean, I don't know, I'm sixth or seventh like all time mm. appearance. That's that's like, I mean, it's crazy. Do you know what I mean? I, don't, I, don't, I mean, to think that I'm like the the sixth or seventh highest appearance player, and the club was founded in. 18 whatever it is i mean it's just crazy yeah. i mean to, to, to be in the top 10 alone yeah. i mean that sends goose pimples around me, 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 on, on my spine and and then i think something oh my gosh if i wasn't in that season i could have been maybe in this position <laughs> i could have been higher i mean it's just yeah i'm very 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 fortunate i'm very blessed to have 
one to be a professional player and two to see out my career my whole career at Luton I mean I have no no regrets and thinking you know you have players who have moved on and gone to different clubs who no I mean I'm I'm totally happy to be known as like Marvin from Luton and not another club that's a lovely place to leave it thanks so much for your time Marvin it's been a pleasure you're welcome Harry hope it goes well for you okay <laughs> <laughs>